fallen angels uniting with human women to produce Nephilim, giants who upon their death begin to roam the earth, tempting humanity. That's the obscure biblical idea that I want to talk about in this video in relation to the political theology of the ancient world, whereby kings often legitimated themselves on the basis of kinship with gods, with non human entities. The Book of Enoch tells us that the fallen angels or watchers who lusted after human women engendering giant offspring with them are chained up in a cosmic prison beyond the sky and earth, yet also somehow present on earth, projecting themselves in different forms to lead astray the seed of Adam that we might offer them sacrifices. Biblical demonology, the strangeness of which is not always acknowledged, actually has it that after these giant sons of the fallen angels drowned in the flood or were slain thereafter, their spirits began to roam the earth as hungry demons causing trouble for humanity. This is where what we can call the ritual hypothesis concerning the Nephilim enters in, that the authors of the scripture, whether you believe in the larger theology or not, were referencing a certain ritual known to the ancient world wherein a god was believed to participate in the union of man and woman, usually king and temple prostitute, and then to have some patronage over the resulting heir. The scribes of Genesis and the Book of Enoch seem to be saying that in order to obtain an earthly avatar, the watchers needed to participate in human reproduction, possess the resulting child, which was endowed of special abilities, gigantism, leaving a ghostly form thereafter, a kind of spectral anchor upon the earth even after death. Interestingly, these images now recur in what we could call the contemporary mythology around remote viewing and alien encounters, the paranormal, and so on. That they, they are a phenomenon that is both here and not here at the same time. That it's you're, you are literally dealing with angels and demons. Um, and he was pointing behind us. So me and my brother, we look behind us, and then we see these three nine, ten-foot-tall creatures. It looked like it was glitching. A really large pyramid, some form of protective protection of survivors of some cataclysm. I think they're all dead. It's it's like a special race of people or something. I'm getting humans just like we are, but I'm not so sure they're humans like we understand human because they're way bigger. So what do you mean? I said they're like 10 feet tall, really huge. Now, one hypothesis is that the Nephilim are the children of the Sethites, those would be the sons of God because they're a holier people, and the women of the Cainites because they're less holy, they're just daughters of man and not uh, referred to as uh, having kinship with God. That's actually what St. Augustine believed, and you find a pretty good summation of this view in Through New Eyes by theologian James Jordan. The problem with this view is that there's no particular reason why the Cainites are specifically daughters of Adam compared to the Sethites. In fact, it is Seth who's described as being in the image of Adam and bearing both sons and daughters. The earliest view in church history is actually that the angels of God or sons of God who lust after human women are not human themselves, that they are supernatural entities. And we have various scriptures that talk about spirits who disobeyed, fallen angels in the days of Noah, and so on. The term itself is best understood as either a noun that comes from Aramaic nafila, because that would produce nephilim in Hebrew, or it might be a, an Aramaic verb nafal, that would also produce nephilim. Uh, in both cases, you would have uh, either fallen ones in the sense that there's something corrupt about them, there's something malformed. Uh, 
uh, something uh, uh, in terms of a grotesque or odd appearance. And if it's the noun, nafilah, that noun in Aramaic means giant. And this is important because a lot of scholars feel that the context for Genesis 1 through 11 is Babylon, whether it was composed in the Babylonian era or whether it draws on Babylonian uh, items or motifs for theological purposes. Aramaic was where uh, uh, the Hebrews were exposed to the block script and that language because after the cuneiform languages in Babylon, Aramaic was the language of the period. So it makes sense that there would be this, be this connection. The other thing I would say is when you go to other translations of the Hebrew Bible, and specifically I mean here the Septuagint, which is the Greek translation of the Hebrew Old Testament, and also Targums, which are the Aramaic translation of the Old Testament, in both of those cases, they will use words in their language that mean giant for Nephilim. They don't opt for something more abstract like fallen ones. The Septuagint use, uses gigantes which is giants. So I think it's very consistent. It's more consistent with the way ancient translators apparently understood the term to argue for the fact that, hey, the spelling's important, and the only way you really get to the biblical spelling is starting with a word that means giant uh, in Aramaic. The engendering of the Nephilim occurs within the context of what we may call the Bible's recurring theme of a satanic marriage alliance. The first instance is, of course, early in Genesis when Eve is seduced by the devil into consuming from the tree, the serpent, into consuming from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. The second would be the fall of the angels of God who saw that man's daughters were beautiful. Finally, potentially, when Abraham enters the land of Egypt and the Egyptians see that Sarai is beautiful, and take her to the Pharaoh. Now, what's interesting about all of these is that they each refer to seeing that something is beautiful. Although we should note the words that are used are different. In any case, however, what does recur is the meaning and seeing, albeit that is no unique thing because seeing is often an act of assessment or evaluation or judgment in the Bible. Remember, God saw what he had created and saw that it was good. But in this context, we can establish something of a typology because each time something is being seen to be attractive, it should not be partaken in, and it has to do with the genders, even Genesis 3, insofar as it causes the first rift between Adam and Eve, since Adam blames Eve for listening to the serpent. And it's been argued that this typological connection is made explicit by Isaiah 30, verses 1 through 3, where the Lord says that the children who have gone down to Egypt to seek refuge there have done wrong. So the children here could be referring typologically back to the sons of God going to Egypt, Abraham seeking refuge there as well as being a prophecy. Specifically, what's interesting here, however, is that there is a demonic element because Isaiah 30, verse 6, talks about a fiery serpent flying. You've got a lion and a lioness, presumably proper male and female, righteous male and female, but then you have an interfering presence, the fiery serpent. So perhaps seeking refuge in Egypt, even as Abram did, encounters some demonic presence in the Pharaoh, in the Egyptians, similar to the demonic presence that earlier in Genesis we read about, both the serpent and the sons of God who fell. Because a supernatural element is discussed each time, we can say that even accepting this typology, it doesn't particularly lead to the conclusion that James Jordan and St. Augustine arrived at, to name one very modern and one very old uh, theologian, 
that um, the sons of God are human. Now, even in the case of seeking refuge in Egypt, there seems to be something else uh, involved there. We're also going to see that this all relates to the nations and to political authority. But just sticking to the idea of the supernatural, we've looked at Numbers, which has an explicit account of giants, actual large beings. And we also have Deuteronomy 3.11. It reads, For only Og, king of Bashan, remained of the remnant of giants. Behold, his bedstead was a bedstead of iron. Is it not in Rabath of the children of Ammon? Nine cubits was the length thereof, and four cubits the breadth of it, after the cubit of a man. Now, cubits varied, because that depends on the actual physical proportions of people, uh, often of the king himself. But the point here is that he's physically larger than normal. But even here, you could interpret this as a sort of liturgical body, um, a large body that has some canonical size, which is attributed to the spiritual magnitude of kingship. In Unseen Realms, theologian Michael Heiser writes the following, quote, the most immediate link back to the Babylonian polemic is Og's bed, Hebrew Eris. Its dimensions, nine by four cubits, are precisely those of the cultic bed in the ziggurat called Etemenanki, which is the ziggurat most archaeologists identify as the Tower of Babel referred to in the Bible. Ziggurats functioned as a temple and divine abode, the unusually large bet at Etemenanki, presumably the Tower of Babel ziggurat, was housed the house of the bed, Bet Ersi section. It was the place where the god Marduk and his divine wife, Zarpanitu, met annually for ritual lovemaking, the purpose of which was divine blessings upon the land. Scholars have been struck by the precise correlation. It's hard not to conclude that like Genesis 6, verses 1 through 4, those who put the finishing touches on the Old Testament during the exile in Babylon were connecting Marduk and Og in some way. Sacred marriage rituals included the blessing of fertility for both the land and its inhabitants. The ritual was also concerned with maintaining the cosmic order instituted by the gods. Consequently, in addition to the gigantism element, a link between Og and Marduk via the matching bed dimension, may also have telegraphed the idea that Og was the main inheritor and perpetuator of the Babylonian knowledge and cosmic order from before the flood, end quote. So the idea there is that Og is somehow the last remnant, as Deuteronomy 3.11 puts it, specifically of the Babylonian ritualistic political theology. We can pick up on the fact that it's the bed that's being referred to specifically as potentially a reference to this kind of mm, bed chamber marriage ritual between humans and gods that would have been at the heart of many of these monarchical investiture ceremonies. Although the point has been made that maybe what happened was that the authors of Deuteronomy were aware of certain gravestones which would be very very large from the late bronze age and then interpreted them as a, a bed but these would have been relatively common and deuteronomy 3 is quite specific it's referring to a specific case we now have very solid evidence that what the authors of genesis 6 those early verses of genesis 6 are doing is that they're commenting on mesopotamian mythology around the apkalus around these supernatural beings founding great lineages so you can't really get away from that this is an anti-pagan critique or polemic and in this regard we have the research of amar anus on the origin of watchers a comparative study of the antediluvian wisdom in mesopotamian and jewish traditions which is well worth taking a look at, but I'm just going to quote from the conclusion. The mythology of the Watchers and their sons, the Giants, derived from inverted versions of various Mesopotamian myths and beliefs about Kalus. In some parts or layers of Mesopotamian mythology and ritual practices, the sages were already regarded as dangerous and potentially malicious creatures 
upon which Jewish authors could build their parody. So this isn't a blanket condemnation of paganism. Some elements within Mesopotamian religiosity were on the same wavelength as the Genesis polemic. We can also point to the fact that in Menduraki, the seventh Mesopotamian pre-flood, because of course they have a myth of the flood as well, king is very similar to Enoch in various specific features. So the patriarchs of pre-flood Mesopotamian mythology are actually endorsed by the Bible. It's just the belief that the angels who breed with humans, the Apkalus, who produce lineages, are good guys that the Bible diverges with Mesopotamian mythology on. And it's particularly worth pointing out that the connection to Mesopotamian myth is completely explicit in the Book of Giants because it specifically refers to Gilgamesh as one of the gigantic offspring of the Watchers. And in fact, we, we have some cuneiform evidence that Gilgamesh was at some point considered to have been a giant by the Mesopotamians themselves. Now, Gilgamesh in Tablet 1, sections 47 and 48, is referred to as being two-thirds divine. But that's a relatively late account. In the earlier Sumerian king list, Gilgamesh is described as the son of a wind, or a ghost, a spirit, depending on how the relevant term is translated. And in earlier versions of the Sumerian epic tradition, we find that he is the son of Lugalbanda and the goddess Ninsun. There's no mention of divine versus human fractions in his heritage. It may be the term two-thirds meant almost. In fact, we have a Mesopotamian text called the Dialogue of Pessimism in which somebody is described as being two-thirds of an idiot. So he's almost a complete idiot. But that doesn't come up that often in Mesopotamian writings one would imagine that it's being applied to Gilgamesh has some more precise meaning. It may have to do with the traditional notion of human beings being composed of three parts, the tripartite human being, body, mind, or in Greek, psyche, and spirit, so that perhaps two of, of his parts are divine, the physical part not, but the mind and the spirit divine, but there's nothing in the texts to indicate that. The suggestion, however, that the king or the queen is considered divine and that a divine patron takes possession of one of the spouses and acts as a third parent, a divine patron would be the wind, the ghost, the spirit, would account for another divine third, so that the giant essentially has three parents, two of them divine, one of them human. I don't mean to entirely disparage the figure of Gilgamesh. There's a lot of positive material that comes under the umbrella of stories about him, just the particular version of his origins that possibly deals with this ritual context. Let's look at some historic examples of what uh, this may have looked like when it manifests in uh, different geographical and, and, and civilizational contexts. In terms of Near Eastern examples, um, we have... The following from Marti Nisenen, the Akkadian Rituals and Poetry of Divine Love, quote, We only have a collection of random hints which, however, leave no room for doubt that the rituals were indeed celebrated from the Neo-Assyrian to the late Babylonian, or Seleucid, period, in different Mesopotamian cities. And not only that, but they also provide occasional glimpses at the details and venues of the ceremonies. And in Pongratz Leiston's Sacred Marriage and the Transfer of Divine Knowledge, alliances between the gods and the king in Mesopotamia, ancient Mesopotamia, we read the following. What the ancients in the Near East have left us are numerous documents dealing with cultic prescriptions regulating interaction with the gods in the daily and festal cults. These divinatory texts and literary texts witness to a variety of key metaphors. One of the key metaphors used to express the close communication between gods and the king was sacred marriage. Sacred marriage can take many forms. Cosmogamy, the union between the cosmic elements of heaven and earth. 
hierogamy, the union between a goddess and a king, and theogamy, the union between a god and a goddess. While cosmogamy remains restricted primarily to literary texts, that is, to cosmologies, hierogamy and theogamy find their places within the complex communication process between the gods and the king. Therefore, they become part of the narratives and rituals regulating the interaction between the divine and the human spheres. Often cited example is that of the Daijosai, which is a ritual when a Japanese emperor comes into his post, wherein the emperor spends a night with the sun goddess Amaterasu, from which the imperial line is said to descend. Now, this is from a CNN article in which we read that in the 1920s, the belief accepted by the state was that the emperor had conjugal relations with the sun goddess, apparently, but that that view has sort of fallen into disfavor. And it also makes sense because there's been a secularizing of the imperial post. The emperor now does not claim to be divine. It's interesting that his not claiming to be divine coincides with the notion that there is no carnal or conjugal relation with the goddess any longer. In the Cambodian case, we have a 13th century Chinese traveler to the Angkor Wat complex in Cambodia called Zhou Daguan, who wrote in his journals that the king of Khmer would sleep with a magical nine-headed naga, a snake person. That's from Indian tradition. You get nagas in the main Indian epics, like the Mahabharata, for example. So these are serpent uh, creatures, intelligent, sentient serpent creatures. Some are good, some are bad. But anyway, that the king of Khmer in Angkor Wat would sleep with, have relations with, a nine-headed naga woman every night at the top of his tower, and that if he should fail to do so, it was considered to bode badly for the health of the kingdom. Now, importantly, neither the Japanese nor the Cambodian case, nor many of these uh, equivalent cases, talk about an offspring who is then half human, half divine being produced from these unions. Rather, the idea here is that the king receives power, knowledge, etc. to continue ruling by way of a union, a carnal union in some respect, a, an actual uh, erotic union with a supernatural being. Perhaps the point is that what's being conceived and rebirthed is the polity itself, the political entity itself. That's the giant. The higher principle or concept of correspondence is replaced by a spirit who reifies it and turns it towards idolatry. Like any confusion of the planes, this leads to gigantism, where the imminent or historical or political plane is made to bear the weight of grander spiritual principles, thus the imperialism and totalitarianism that result. That's for the uh, for another video on uh, Gigantomachy, on the War of the Giants. Not siding here with the disenchantment of the world and losing the romance and the deeper meaning of ritual. It's the opposite. I'm saying that certain errors might be interwoven in some inherited traditions and need to be rectified. But there's a middle way between secular materialism and idolatrous superstition. And we have the example of Roman imperial symbolism, for example, which was largely salvaged and reworked outside of its initial idolatrous context. It's not a perfect example, but it marks the way. Let's dig in a little more into the philosophical and metaphysical underpinnings of this Nephilim ritual and where it goes wrong. If we think of reality as consisting of two fundamental forces, the eternal masculine and the eternal feminine, yang and yin, heaven and earth, Aristotle's essence and substance. The one is analogous to shape, like a circle, and the other to color, say blue. But every circle we encounter in the world has to have some particular color, and every instance of color will be in some shape. If we try to unite a particular shape with the abstract category of color, or some color with shape as such, we fail, necessarily. And if we think we've drawn a circle that has no color, a pure circle that transcends color, 
We're only pretending that its color, whatever it happens to be, is somehow neutral and universal transcending the limitations of color, and that's what imperialism consists of, for example, pretending that a set of particular features are universal, and so ending up imposing them on everybody. In human terms, and returning to the issue of bedchamber rituals in the ancient world, the proper order of things is for a wife and husband to be analogous to the universal categories of earth and heaven. Their union serves as a microcosm of the macrocosmic correspondence between the eternal feminine and masculine. If one attempts to unite with the universal as such, pretending that the latter universal is some definite being, a god, that they can mate with, they're succeeding only in uniting with some counterfeit because a particular being cannot relate to the universal on its own plane. A human can't mate with an archetype, with a god any more than a circle can be drawn in color as such, and not in some specific color. Okay, so that's the sort of philosophical mistake, I think, that ultimately is being made in these kinds of uh, rituals. And the Bible does present the gender-swapped version at the end in the Apocalypse, where the whore of Babylon and the kings of the earth fornicating with her is basically a recurrence of the Nephilim theme. The abominations in her cup are like the giants. And the result there, just as the parody of masculinity was to try to apply unity of principle on the created plane, and it results in gigantism, the female principle of harmony that's likewise literalized ends up in celebrating every possible form in every possible combination. So instead of harmony, chaos. The cup of abominations, everything mixed together, the orgy. Just as in the case of the masculine, instead of unity, uniformity. Giants consuming everything, joining everything together, both end up resulting in a loss of distinction, a loss of forms. Tower of Babel, Cup of Abominations are just uh, two different uh, gendered formats of the same satanic parody of Eden. What this kind of political prostitution looks like today is that political elites will not court their own society. That they will court supposed representatives of universal principles of the international society. It's more important to get funding from private equity managers or international institutions and conform to their political schemes than it is to be favored by your local constituents. And as that happens, which is a version of the kings of the earth fornicating with the whore of Babylon, you get the giants, the abominations, massively uniformalizing monocultural systems of control start to develop, reproducing the Tower of Babel dynamic. Now, the result of the Nephilim ritual is tyranny. And we have an anthropological theme that's observable across traditions in which uh, political elites often want to be foreign with respect to the people that they rule. The Aztec emperor Moctezuma famously said to Hernan Cortes that he and the rest of the Aztec ruling class originated from somewhere across the eastern uh, sea. In other words, that they came from where Cortes had come from, unlike the bulk of the population, the bulk of the Mexica and other peoples ruled by them. But it's a very general, observable tendency, writes Mary Helm in Access to Origins, Affinities, Ancestors, and Aristocrats, quote, elite claims of foreign affiliation and identification served to disconnect or distance Maya lords from their subjects, end quote. She's discussing this phenomenon in terms of the Mesoamerican Mayan civilization. Andreas Stone, in Disconnection, Foreign Insignia, and Political Expansion, describes the same thing as the implementation of an exclusive dynastic line which defines itself in terms of palpably different qualities not seen in the general population. The point is that there's this conception, which is at times promoted by the elite itself, that it is foreign with respect to the general population, and that such a conception can lead to extravagances in the exercise of power, to tyranny, ultimately. The Nephilim ritual would be an extreme case of that idea, right? And the idea of being 
divine and mythologizing the origins of a dynasty as having some non-human origin, a progenitor who did not belong to the human species, the ultimate foreigner, would open up the king to conceive of himself as so different from the normal ordinary subject that political authority could be exercised in this hyperbolic tyrannical way because we belong to different species and that which is appropriate for me is completely different from that which is appropriate to you as a commoner so you could say that creating this concept that a dynasty originates with a non-human entity allows the exercise of power to be uh, carried out all the more um, rapaciously and tyrannically and in spiritual terms opens up the monarch to be sinful towards the population even to be open to demonic possession in 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 systems that believe in such a thing these are often related to monarchical investiture the royal families and their legitimacy, which makes sense because in biblical theology, the fall of the angels of God is related to the administrators of the nations. So a different angelic intelligence has been placed over each nation. And so the, uh, the fall has to do with those administrators or an element of that national angelic administration. The issue of what constitutes an angelic fall, what falls, what doesn't, and how the nations and human diversity relates to that and how it's to be redeemed in the biblical narrative and in other narratives and other theologies is a topic for a whole other video. But just to note that in the book of Enoch, it is the 70 nations, 70 being the number of nations or 72 listed in Genesis that are brought up in the context of the judgment on the fallen angels. And it's interesting to look into the book of Enoch as far as this Nephilim ritual hypothesis, because it does find some support in, in first Enoch. Here's what we have in this mess. <laughs> And believe me, this is why scholars of, of uh, Jewish angelology just want to pull their hair out. You have watchers in prison in Tartarus or the abyss. You have watchers spirits that are still free to go run around the earth. These spirits can change form. You have giants follow, fathered by the spirits, the watchers, apparently referring to the original offenders of Genesis 6 who were in prison. But then you have giants themselves called watchers or evil spirits. And then you have them in the earth and on the earth. And... Pun intended, what in hell is going on here? I think chapter 15 of the Book of Enoch is one of the most important passages because it really is hinting at this idea that there's a ritual dimension to what's being described here. So briefly, 1st Enoch 15 describes the Watchers as being born from men, not women this time, men, but having their primal origin in the Watchers. So it's as though the origin in the Watchers is somehow mediated by men which opens up the possibility that it's men identifying ritually with that fallen angel in the act of conception. And then later in that chapter, we read that the spirits that proceed from the giants, so after they've been slain, remain on the earth, causing havoc among humanity, hungering and thirsting. Interestingly, it also tells us that the spirit born of heaven remains in heaven in some wise, and the one born on earth remains on earth. So it's like the origin of a thing determines where it's going to remain. And sure enough, in chapter 18, the angels are in some kind of a celestial station. It's a place beyond heaven and earth where they're being kept in prison for disobedience. And yet, at the same time, their spirits are assuming many forms and tempting humanity into sacrificing to demons as gods, chapter 19. So yeah, they're in a cosmic prison house beyond heaven and earth, but they're manifesting, projecting onto the earth. And the terms in which this spirit of theirs that they project onto the earth to tempt people is described are similar to the terms in which the spirits that preceded, the ghosts, of the giants have been described in chapter 15 in terms of corrupting humanity and in terms of thirsting, hungering in the case of the ghosts of the Nephilim and wanting people to sacrifice, to make sacrifices in the case of the watchers. The sacrifices would be the way in which some 
semblance of quenching that thirst seems to be achieved, even though ultimately they cannot feed. We're told that they cannot feed. And so we might posit that the watchers were able to manifest some kind of an earthly form and possess human bodies, that's the Nephilim, but that the fallen angel and the ghost of the giant, the demon, are not ontologically separate. They're just two avatars of the same being. There certainly does seem to be some sense of bilocality just going off what chapters 18 and 19 tell us. And it doesn't seem like too much of a leap that this subsumes the spirit of the Nephilim, that it was never really a separate entity. We can take the reference to the spirits of heaven dwelling in heaven as a reference, and this is speculative, to the idea that the human soul of the person engendered by the Nephilim ritual is redeemable, is salvageable. Human beings, after all, ultimately go to heaven. They can dwell there. They have some supernal origin in God. And so the contrast between the spirit that can dwell in heaven and the one that remains on earth because it was created on the earth may have to do with the distinction between the human portion and the ultimately empty, ontologically unstable form of the fallen angel that was created as a giant to dwell on earth and whose true being is actually in that cosmic prison and not really on the earth at all. It doesn't have being the way other creatures do. Then again, since the Book of Enoch understands humans as being able to develop into an angelic form, it seems it really does present us with entities that are capable of biological union with humans. They're similar enough to humans for that to happen and happen to produce non-viable, violent, gigantic offspring. And then the link to Mesopotamian political legitimation and that of other pagans would be encoded into the narrative by Israelite tradition, seeing the latter as sort of connected to this ancient event. That's one way to interpret it. So that's the case for the Nephilim narrative in the Bible and in the Book of Enoch being about this kind of ritualization in which it's considered that a god, the Bible would say a demon, becomes a third parent to a child and then invests that child with its own presence, some kind of a supernatural boon, which makes the child a particularly powerful force in life and an advantage to the kingdom, etc., but which is ultimately corrupting, leads to overconsumption, as the Book of Enoch tells us, imperialism, and that's linked to the philosophical error in the idea that an archetypical category can be an actual entity that relates biologically to humans, and that the king can be at the level of relating physically to an archetypical category, to a god, to a, an angel. It's a mixture of different planes, which explains why there's so much uh, emphasis on rejecting inappropriate mixture in the biblical narrative. And the fact that these kinds of things are coming up again in the consciousness and people are referring to them and seeing them and having that kind of uh, modern paranormal mythology really emphasizing this kind of a figure may be partly connected to the idea that we're making that mistake now in this phase of our history. Now there's a bunch of other topics there. Noah and how he gets confused for a Nephilim in one of the Enochic narratives. Egyptian pagan material and how that relates to a lot of this stuff. Mexican folklore, European folklore and how that relates to this. The symbolism of the ghost of the giants in particular, which I didn't really dig into in this video. There's a bunch of other things, but I think this one is long enough as is. In any case, thank you very much for watching. Subscribe if you want to. Until next time.